Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, this was prepared for my Sunday evening, so uh, this is going to be from Psalm 119. Who's surprised? <laughs> Probably not many. Uh, we spoke last week over Psalm 119, 73 through 88, and uh, talked about a lot of different things. We may review some of that next week, but we're not going to do any kind of questioning of you now. But it brings us to Psalm 119.89, probably one of the more um, well-known verses from this particular chapter. Um, uh, Forever, o, o Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Um, this specific verse is a lot of time used in reference to um, the eternality and finality of the word of God. It, and when people are talking about the inspired word and the and the, and the, and the, uh, the strength of the scriptures to prevail throughout eternal throughout the uh, years for it to survive wars and famines and and, and and all that stuff is true. But again, every verse is stronger and more meaningful within the context of which which it was written. Now we know for a fact that the the Bible was not broken up into chapters and verses when it was initially written, but we know also that Psalm 119 actually was broken down into these right. specific sections because they are lettered for us. They are they it's like bullet points almost all the way all the way down through this. So we we look at Psalm uh, Psalm 119 89 to 96 as a unit as mm -hmm. an entire as an entire piece, and so we're gonna. I'm probably going to read all the way through to the end. I may make a comment or two, and then we're going to go back and talk about it because there's actually some interesting things to bring out here. Uh, in verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. Amen. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for, they are, for, all, for all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in my affliction. I will for ne never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all, of all perfection, but thy commandment is succeeding broad. Amen. We have a, a, a verse here where the psalmist, he makes this broad statement at the beginning, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, and then gives it some, uh, an example, some, some, uh, some context for which we can grasp, and then takes that idea and apply, really it, it, is, it is the uh, kind of blueprint for a, a really good Sunday school lesson, Amen. Uh, to taking ta taking an idea and busting it down where everybody can see it, and then applying it to yourself. And, and, and the psalmist actually lays it out really, really nicely here for us. And the the overarching theme, as I see it, um, and, and I believe that the, the Lord has revealed it to us, is the Word of God and your appointment. In it, and the happiness and um, and the joy that you can find in your appointment, and you say, well, "What does that have to do with forever, O Lord, Thy word is settled in heaven?" It says, "Well, well, he kind of explains that in ninety and ninety one, where he says, um, Thy faithfulness unto all generations, Thou hast established the earth and it abideth.' So he takes this idea and he says, His words established forever.' But let's talk about a specific influence of his word and that was in creation it says that that you that, that he has uh that has, uh, established the earth what in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word right. was, was god or you go all the way back to genesis 1 1 and says uh in the beginning god created heaven and earth the earth was without form and void uh and he speaks things into being amen let there be light all right and none of that has changed. Right. He makes a, a, a comparison to the eternality of God's words, God's commandments, God's power, to the fact that, hey, this, 
big blue and green marble that we walk on every single day has not ceased to provide us resources, has not ceased to provide us oxygen to breathe, water to drink, protection from the earth's, from the sun's violent solar radiation. Right. And it just keeps going. The foundation of environmentalism is that we're burning the earth out. That after a while, humans will deplete every resource that this planet has to offer. Now, if you look at something like, and they've done it around here, actually they're doing a lot more of it right now, like um, clear cutting. Not, 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 you know, not going out into the woods and saying, I want this large tree taken and that large tree taken. No, taking everything that you could make a two before or chipboard out of, just all out of the ground. It could, you, you know, you walk into what used to be, you know, 100 acre stands of woods, and there ain't, and you can see all the way to the end of that 100 acres now, you can say, well, yeah, we're, we're probably burning the resources down. But then you go to places like Alaska that there's the wilderness that has not been touched. That right. you, know, you can fit Texas multiple times inside that stand. You're like, well, actually, we probably have more trees than we know. We haven't got since. Um, you're, not, you're not going to outgive or outtake away from this earth because it is established. Amen. We understand just based on revelation alone, the earth is going to last the exact amount of time it needs to last. And really the only way that the earth ends is God destroys it. Amen. Right. He burns it. He says, I'm gonna start all over. Burns it all off, new, he new heaven, new earth, Amen. new Jerusalem, all coming down and everything, everything is peace and perfection again. But right up into that moment now, we see some horrible things happening in Revelation, but right up into that moment, we never see, see anything about, uh, we see water turning bad, but we never see a lack of water right. in Revelation. We see the sun burning people pretty bad, but we never see the atmosphere disappearing. These are all things that environmentalists would, would get on your get on your case about. You, know, you, need to, you need to drive them electric cars, and you need to, <laughs> and you, need to uh, 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 you know, uh, make sure that your trash is disposed of in about 17 different cans so that it's all disposed of in the right place. And, and not that any of that isn't good. Now, I don't think we, we, we're, we're given to be caretakers of this planet. Right. But even on a larger scale, the fixed nature of the sun, our light source in this universe, also the thing that keeps us doing this, we're in perpetual falling on this ellipses Amen. that we're going around. Uh, around the sun gives us our seasons, gives us our heat. You know, if we were, you know, a, a handful of inches closer to the sun or a handful of inches further away, we would freeze or burn. Right. That's right. And all this stuff has just been spinning for thousands and thousands of years at the behest of physics. Maybe you want to call it that. At the, at the behest of um, you know, uh, what's the what's the law? I'm trying to think of the physical law where you know, an object will continue in motion unless it's interrupted. Uh, uh, you know, is, is, is all is, is is that all? Escape? No, this is all at the behest of our God. Amen. He said, "Do this," and they continue to do this. And he actually sort of bullet points this in verse 91. They continue this day according to thy ordinances. For they are thy servants. Amen. He takes something as powerful as the sun, something that foreign cultures have deified mm -hmm. in at various points in history, and he not only says, "Hey, you're, they're following the path that they've always been set to follow, and will continue to follow until the end of time." He also says, "And they're beneath you." Amen. They're your servants. They're your slaves. And this actually does carry the, the this word in Hebrew, as it was translated, does carry sort of a, a slave-like connotation. Mm -hmm. There's no option. Now we don't live in a society where you know if, if Brother Larry tomorrow wanted to become president president of the United States, it might be an uphill battle. Uh, but there's nothing preventing him for shoot, from shooting for that goal. Because we live in the type of country we live in, which is great, but we have no concept of real servitude. The best example we actually have 
are the, 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 the tyrannical nature of the corporate workplace mm-hmm. um, where you don't have any choice. You either do your job or you're fired, <laughs> right? That's, mm-hmm. that's how, how that works. You, you do what you're asked to do or you're fired. But Larry, I guess, cats out of the bag as, uh, because of the paper. He, he swapped jobs uh, sometime uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, and I thought, somebody told me that he was D-O-N over here at the nurse home, but it wasn't that. It says some, some kind of uh, manager of nurses or something like that. I forget what it was now. But there are specific duties assigned to that position, aren't there? Uh, and, and, and you've got to meet those duties. The, the, you don't have an option. They didn't say, hey, Brother Larry, if you can, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind coming into work a handful of hours a week, I'm self-employed, and so he's like, well, you're the king of your own castle. Yeah. Um, if I don't show up at 8 o'clock, people will stop showing up to get haircuts. Mm-hmm. We have to show up at a specific time, a specific place, do a specific set of duties. And the, Lord, and, and, and the psalmist says, because the, the word of the Lord is so final and so faithful and so eternal, when he makes a decree to a celestial body, it is their job until, until it stops. Right. Then he turns around and he starts talking about, now here goes the spiritual application. Unless thy law have been my delights, then I should have perished in my affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. Now, the psalmist was in affliction. The psalmist had, had problems. A, a lot of the psalm is about crying. The psalm is about crying out to the Lord in a state of trouble. Nothing that we've ever seen before. But he said he, he, he focuses on the law and he says, I will never forget thy precepts. Now, this mm-hmm. word precepts carries with it the, the meaning of appointment. Right. Which means. The psalmist may have been in affliction because he wasn't in his appointment. Right. He says, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. The psalmist draws a very, very, very clear line between doing your spiritual job and life of happiness. Now, I'm not going to say in the flesh, if you're doing what, you're, what you've been spiritually called to do, that every day is just going to be a jump up, up and down, you know, have a great time. I am not a, a help. I'm actually kind of a little bit of a pessimist. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to jump up and down. Everything's going to be happy all the time kind of guy. I, I just don't. In, in the world that we live in, we're certainly not going to receive that. But there is spiritual joy to be gained from doing your duty. Amen. And you have one. Oh, Larry, I don't have one. Have you looked? Have you prayed? Have you sought the Lord's face? Well, Larry, is there ever a more joyful time for you than when you're behind a pulpit preaching the Word of God, doing your duty? Right. It outweighs your the joy you might derive from nursing. It outweighs the joy you might derive from being a father or grandfather. It outweighs it outweighs all that because you have you are tapping into an everlasting wellspring. Man. And we just don't most of the time. A lot of Christians spend their lives warming those seats. Mm. And and that is not what we're called to do. Ladies, y'all have some kind of duty too. There are many examples of women in scriptures doing things. And most of the examples in scriptures, in fact, I would, I would dare say all of them, save you know, my mind forgetting something, have nothing to do with sitting and listening to the preacher. Hmm. Not, a, not a one of them. They're active, participating roles that further the goals and the plans of our Lord God. If David had been the type of servant that most people are today, do you think he would have been called a man after God's own heart? Right. David was a wonderful king and leader, which was his which was his physical appointment, but he was a masterful songwriter. 
mm-hmm. and understood the nature of God and his role in that nature very well and has outlined it repeatedly through our study of this scripture. I don't think there was ever a more pleasant time for David than when he was holding his heart and communing with the Lord on that level. Amen. It says, verse 94, I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. What does the psalmist request here? He, first of all, he says, I am thine. There is a sense of ownership that the psalmist lends to. And oftentimes when we're not willing to do what God wants us to do, we're not willing to accept our duty, what we're actually saying, and this is what, if, if you were in a job situation, the boss says, hey, this is your job, go do that thing. And you say, no, I want to do something else. Mm-hmm. Now, in corporate America, I don't know about now, but things are so weird now, but in it probably gets you a ride up now, but whenever whenever I was in a regular, you know, nine to five job that wasn't self-employed, you're fired. <laughs> As well you should be. You signed up for this job, we're paying for you this job, go do your job. And in a very similar sense, in this spiritual situation that we find ourselves in, we sometimes we say, I don't want to do that. And the Lord says, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Finding your way back, finding your way out of this affliction, finding your way, finding your way back to the Lord is as simple as saying, I'm thine. Mm -hmm. Relinquishing authority, saying, you're top dog, you're big wood, I'm kindling. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then he says, "Save me, why? For I sought thy precepts. I'm interested in being back in the role that I was designed for." Amen. The wicked have waited uh, for uh, for, uh, for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I've seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is broad. Verse ninety six. He kind of puts a, 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 a period on the end of this very long sentence by saying, he says, I've seen the end of all perfection. And I think what he's talking about is mankind's idea of perfection. Uh, you know, if you look at the pyramids of Giza in, in Egypt, they are aligned with celestial bodies. They have uh, their, their, their geometric positions, I think are, are set on cardinal directions. The construction, there are, there are blocks of the pyramids of Giza that you can't fit a razor blade between. Mm-hmm. Masterful engineering design. Just, just mind-boggling, especially considering what they used to build it. You know? uh, but even those have become beaten down and wore out. Did you know the pyramids of Giza used to be smooth on the side, on the outsides? They're big stair steps now, but there used to be a covering and a gold point on the top of every single one of them. But they're all gone now. Why? Because time and war and scavengers and everything have destroyed them. The best of man's perfection is but a flower in the grass. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And he says, unlike those things, the word of our Lord is Vast, Amen. And so he calls it broad here. Vast and eternal and foundational. I'd say the best biblical example of the ideas that are being brought out here is in the story of Jonah. Hmm. It, uh, you don't have to turn there. It says, Now the word, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of, uh, of Amittai, saying, this is in jo- uh, Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Mm-hmm. What was Jonah's design and purpose? Go to Nineveh and cry against it. Mm-hmm. Tell them their doom. Tell the Assyrians, the enemies of God's people, that they're doomed. So Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish. <laughs> I want to do it my own way. I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to interact with the Assyrians. I want to do what I want to do. Well, 
You go down a little first, further in that ch uh, chapter. <coughs> then the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest so that the ship was likely to be bringing up. Here's the affliction. Here's mm -hmm. the here 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 is the the bad times coming on. Where's Jonah end up? Well, they have to toss him over the side. I'm going to paraphrase the rest of this for lack of time. They toss him over the side of the boat, and he ends up in a whale's belly, a prepared whale's belly. And that fish, mm -hmm. it's called fish in, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament and whale in the New Testament, but that aquatic animal, whatever it was, was specifically designed. Right. Its sole purpose in life was to swallow Jonah up and keep him just alive enough so that he learned his lesson. Right. right. And so Jonah stayed down there. Until chapter 2. Right. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. Mm -hmm. I've had enough of doing it my way. Mm -hmm. He even uses a very similar term, term to what we say, I am thine, save me, in, the, in, in, in Psalm 119. What does he call for in, the, in this chapter? Salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. Right. Now, I think, personally, Jonah was a saved man. He was a backslidden saved man because God doesn't call lost people. Right. But Jonah needed some quickening. Jonah needed to remember who was in charge and what his appointment was. And when he realized that, what's the first thing the fish does? Well, we're going to shore. Mm -hmm. Spits him up on the bank. Jonah beelines to Nineveh. Now, everything that happened after he got there, that's a whole other story for a whole other time. But this is a perfect illustration Amen. of what we see in Psalm 119. You need to find your place, people. And I'm not saying you need to get in your place. That's just a, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a different connotation there, especially depending, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, <laughs> might get, you might get stoned for that. Um, but you need to find whatever your spiritual appointment is. And you have one. Believe me, you've got one. Just because, you know, Sunday school teacher and pastor and preacher and song leader are, are these very, you know, out in public ways of serving God does not mean that there are other places. I run the, the internet ministry for the church here. You know what? I'm in a little room by myself that, honestly, if you didn't know I was back there, you might miss me altogether. Now, I kind of like it that way. Um, but some people wouldn't think that's very glamorous. Right. It's not about glitz and glamour. I, I'm, I'm guessing going and talking to the enemies of God at Nineveh was not a glamorous appointment either. Right. Find it. Get in it. You will derive joy, and it, it, Psalm 119 calls it quickening. Mm -hmm. You will find life and spirit. When we talk about revival and revive us again that's what we're talking about that that spark when you're first saved just so full of joy and peace and happiness is attainable every single day of your life and we say nope don't want that mm. i want to do it my way right. and you know what you're going to be you're going to you're going to hang out in a fish's belly for a long time with that attitude. right yeah. A long time. All right, uh, Brother Larry, if you would dismiss us, and we'll be we we'll done. Lord, we thank you and praise you uh, for the lessons that we have received. Lord, we pray that we'd apply it to our hearts. Lord, that uh, we would use the office that you've given us, that we would be glorifying to you. Lord, that you would help us to find the very spot where we need to serve you. We pray these things in the sweet, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.